like this. This is the shiny zigzag goo. It is not a very bold color change, so here's the side by side. It is the first shiny Pokemon that was able to be found and caught by this abomination without human oversight or intervention. In this video, I will go over how this machine functions, using computer vision and an Arduino to find shinies on a real copy of Pokemon Ruby. In Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, a shiny Pokemon has a 1 in 8,192 chance of appearing in any random encounter, with no way of increasing those odds. Since each encounter is an independent random roll, the way the math works is that you are still not even close to guaranteed to see one after over 8,000 attempts. Instead, you would only see a shiny by then in 63% of cases. It would take about 18,870 encounters before you would have a 90% chance to have encountered at least one. If running through grass with max efficiency and a Pokemon with Illuminate, it would take 63 hours of repetitive grinding. And that's just to see any shiny. If you want to specifically target a Ralts, for example, which has a 4% encounter rate, you would have to run into 142,000 encounters on Route 102 before you have a 50% chance of seeing one. That's 470 hours of optimal grinding. If I wanted to see a shiny in this game, I needed to get creative. Here is an overview of the components in this project. The cartridge is being played on the Game Boy Player, an accessory for the GameCube that allows playing Game Boy and Game Boy Advance games. This device, in addition to giving a physical means of plugging a game into the GameCube, actually contains a full GBA CPU. The only thing the GameCube itself really does is pass through the controller inputs as well as take the processed image and display it on screen. The disc that comes with the player just passes control to the device when it boots up. That means the games are not being emulated as a full Game Boy Advance is running underneath. This is actually why I had to use a Game Boy Player instead of Pokemon Box, which also allows for playing Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire cartridges on the GameCube. In addition to a legitimate copy being ludicrously expensive, that game actually has full ROMs of both Ruby and Sapphire stored on the disc. The ROMs are played on an emulator on the GameCube instead of using the cartridges directly. Back to the Game Boy Player though, the output is sent through component cables to an HDMI converter and then fed into a capture card on the PC. OpenCV reads in the data from the capture card as a video stream for processing. OpenCV is a library for taking in and manipulating image data. I'm using this library for reading in the data from the capture card, performing template matching, and outputting the debug information. That debug information is the images that you see flailing wildly all over the screen. Template matching is where the computer vision part of this project comes into play. Template matching is a relatively direct form of computer vision in which some image, the template, is found inside a larger image. To find a match, the algorithm slides the template across a given image, sums up how closely each pixel matches the value on the template, and then takes the normalized average. This average, represented in a range of 0 to 1, is stored in that particular point and then returned as a matrix. If a point has a value of 1, then the exact same data as the template is found at that point in the image. In the debug output, I'm overlaying the highest match found in a particular screenshot with the template that is being searched for. In this screenshot, you can see that the template being used is part of the fight command for when a battle starts. Since the template is not actually in the image, the percentage match given is very low. All of the control logic for this project is in Python. The Python runs a state machine consisting of states, conditions, and actions. When in a particular state, a corresponding controller executor is set to perform the state action until a particular condition is met. This condition checking is where the template matching comes in. Once a template is found to match over a particular configurable threshold value, the state transition occurs. The current state action finishes, then the next action starts while the conditions change to templates for the new transitions. Here is the current state diagram that the project uses. You can probably see that there are two distinct loops. The smaller loop is the normal flow that happens over 99.9% .9 of the time. Run around until a battle starts. Mash B to get through the text. When the fight box appears, navigate to the run command, run away, and then start again. The larger loop is the actual catch logic for when a shiny is found. While mashing B to get through the beginning of a battle, if the shiny sparkle is seen before the fight box comes up, the machine state switches to a different path. It enters a state where it is again waiting for the fight box to appear, however when it gains control, instead of running away, the bag is selected instead. The machine then navigates to the Pokeball's bag, selects the standard Pokeball, and then just mashes A until the shiny is in the ball. Even though there is a very low likelihood of a Pokemon being caught on the first try, the default cursor position on each turn allows for just mashing A continuously. Once the gotcha text is on screen, it knows that the shiny has been caught, and the grind can continue. So we're still missing something important though, which is how the computer actually sends commands to the game. 
it's not like you can just plug in a USB cable. That is where the Arduino comes in. I created a simple C program that runs on the Arduino to take in commands over the USB port and convert them into binary outputs on specific pins. Each of these pins is connected to a button on a GameCube controller through a logic level adjustment board. This board is needed because this particular Arduino runs on 5 volts, while the buttons on a GameCube controller use 3.5 volts for nominal voltage. Attempting to connect the controller to the Arduino directly could damage the controller, at least more so than what I already did to it, or even the GameCube itself. When a given pin is set to low, it sinks the voltage of a corresponding button to ground, simulating a press. The controller then sends the signal to the GameCube as normal. Also don't worry, this is a crappy third-party controller, not a first-party one. I tried to update the design to have LEDs inside the controller in order to visually show the buttons being pressed. However, the voltage drop from using the LEDs is no longer enough for the controller to detect the buttons being pressed. Luckily, the Game Boy Player seems to allow for any port on the GameCube to be used to control the game, so I can just add a second controller to perform the actual inputs. I have up now some footage with the latest shiny found on stream. So far, the machine has found 5 shinies in total, if I include the shiny Zubat that was found while testing before I added the catch loop to the state machine. I have uploaded the code for the project to GitHub and linked in the description. It's unlikely to be useful to you out of the box due to the specific hardware that is required for the setup to function, but may be useful as a reference for anyone trying to implement a similar project. Add any comments or questions below. I'm still looking to improve and expand this project, potentially using edge detection instead of template matching to make the code less dependent on color profiles. So if you want to see any updates or similar projects, subscribe, since it will likely be a few months until the next video shows up. Thank you for watching.